So in the previous video, uh, we learned how to create iteration and repetition using this new structure that we have learned called the wild loop, okay? Um, which is what you can see right now here on top of, on top of me. Um, however, I was explaining in the previous video how uh, in order to make this work, we basically always follow a very similar pattern, which is we initialize a variable, okay? So something that, for example, starts at the value of zero. Then we use that variable to check the condition of whether we want to the, 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 the while loop to keep iterating or not. And then uh, we change within the iteration loop, we change the value of that variable so that by increasing it, decreasing it, or changing with what, at whatever pace, at some point, this condition doesn't meet anymore. And then the while loop stops and it continues executing. All right. The idea is that this pattern was so common, became so prevalent and so important when writing programs that actually the people who designed computer programs, computer programming languages, decided to create a new structure that replicated this pattern, but it made it more concise and more, um, more explicit, more like a package with this whole, I, this, this whole pattern. And that's what became, very soon became four loops in computer programming. So if we're going to learn a new structure, it's called for loops, and it's by far, far, far one of the most popular, if not the most popular way of doing iteration and creating repetition in most computer programming languages that I know of, including C Sharp, all right? And let's take a look at how that works. So I have copy pasted the code that runs this tiny uh, while loop that we're using to print all numbers from zero to nine to the console. Okay, so this is the basic. And again, we have here the initialization, the update, the check, uh, and the update. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to comment this out. So I'm going to deactivate it from my program. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the same functionality. So printing all the numbers one at a time to the console, but with this other structure, the for loop. And I'm doing this because I want you to keep in mind the mirroring, the symmetry behind this pattern of initialization, check, and update that I'm talking about. The way for loops work are very similar to the structure of the, of the, of the, the structure of the structure is very similar. The syntax of the structure, that's what I meant to say, is very similar to other, to other structures. So we always start, we start with a word, with a keyword, like for example, the, for, the word for in this case, we open and close parentheses and we open and close curly brackets. All right. And inside of this parenthesis, inside of the curly brackets is going to be whatever code we want to run. But inside the parenthesis, not only are we going to have just the check to see if the for loop should continue executing, but we're going to pack those three elements that we need for a correct iteration loop to work. Those being the initialization, the check and the update. So what did we do in our previous while loop? What we did was, first of all, we initialized a variable that we were, that we meant to use in the, while, in the for loop to control the for loop, right? So here we're going to do the same. The first thing, the, the, the inside of this parenthesis, we're going to have the, these three elements. And the first one is going to be the initialization. So here, for example, I can declare my variable, for example, int, i equals zero, for example, and whatever I put inside of this first statement is going to be whatever I initialize for my for loop. Then uh, here inside of the second part, I'm going to write the check or the expression that needs to be true for the for loop to continue executing, just like I had it in my while loop before. So that's going to be i is less than 10, right? And then on my third the third part of this, of this parenthesis, what I'm going to write is what kind of update condition do I want to execute every time the for loop finishes one of its cycles. So in this case, what I want is to take that variable of i and then increase it by one unit. So I'm going to type here i++. All right. And then inside of the block, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the code that I want to run repeatedly over my for loop. All right. If I run this code right now, we can see that I get 
a very similar, actually an identical result to what I was getting before with the while loop. I get all the numbers plotted from 0 to 9, one after the other in my console. Okay. However, the idea here is that I have gotten the exact same result, but in a way, this, instead of taking, I don't know, four, seven, I don't know how many lines of code this is, this is basically one line of code that defines how the for loop works, and another line of code, which is the code that happens in between, in, inside, of the, inside of the block. Remember, I don't have to, this, I don't have to have it anymore inside of my for loop, because it's already part of the declaration of the for loop. Before we go into any more examples, I want to really make sure that we understand what's going on here, because it's my experience that for loops, um, sometimes when we're beginning, it takes a little bit of time to wrap our hands around how they work. So I'm going to remove all this fluff from here, and I'm going to concentrate on what we have. And I want to make sure that we understand how a for loop works. Again, the for loop has three main parts. And when the computer reaches the for loop for the first time, what it does is, first of all, it runs this piece of code, the initialization. It creates a new variable called i, which is only going to have, it's going to have a life expectancy only of the life of the for loop. Right after we finish executing the for loop, this variable i is going to cease to exist. It's not going to exist anymore. And that is because of the rules of variable scoping, which I haven't explained yet, but I will explain um, very soon uh, in another video. Um, and then when this code, when this gets executed, all right, we have a new variable called i. It has the value of zero. Then the first check kicks in. And the first check is, is this variable i, is this less than 10? If all of this is true, then the for loop is going to run one cycle, all right? So what happens is that because this is true, we run the first cycle here, we, run, we print the value of zero to the console, and then after we execute this line, this block, then this update triggers in, it kicks in. And then the value of i gets increased by one unit. At that point, we start the new cycle of the for loop again. The new cycle starts by checking if i is less than 10. Remember that i now has the value of 1. It is less than 10, so the block of code inside of the for loop executes. At this point, we print to the console the value of 1, and then the update condition triggers after we execute this. So now, by the end of the for loop, the value of i has the value of 2. We start over again. We check i number 2 is less than 10, so we print number 2 to the console, and then i becomes 3. 3 is less than 10, we print 3, and then becomes 4. 4, 4, 5. 5, 5, 6, 6, 6, 7, 7, 7, 7 8, 8, 8, 8, 9. 9 is less than 10, we print 9 to the console, and then i gets the value of 10. And then a new cycle of the for loop kicks in. 10, at this point, is not less than 10 anymore. It is equal to, to 10, but it's not less than 10. That's why, at this point, the for loop breaks. We do not get to print the value of 10 to the console. That's why, on this series, the numbers are, start, are ending at 9. And then the program continues with whatever code was running afterwards. And that's when we hit the console read key, which stops the console program. It waits for a key, and then we can shut down, and the program is done. All right? This is the main way for loops work. Uh, and this probably here, the printing the first 10 numbers, is probably the most canonical way of, of, of writing a for loop. But there are many, many different ways of writing for loops, and there are many different options. So for example, let's say that I wanted to, instead of writing the first 10 numbers, I wanted to write them at intervals of 2. So what I can do is I can say, uh, instead of increasing the value of i by 10, by 1 unit, I'm going to increase it by 2 units. And then when I run this code, you can see that I print 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, but I also don't print 10, because when the i gets the value of 10, then 10 is not less than 10, so it doesn't, the, the 
this, the, the code in the block doesn't kick in. Let's say that I wanted to print more numbers. I can increase the value of the limit to, for example, the value of 100. And if I do that, then my program is going to print out a huge list of numbers all the way up to 98 at intervals of 2. Okay? Now, I can also just I can also start at any random number. So for example, I can start with the value of 90, all right? And at intervals of 2, I will basically print a series from 9, 92, 94, 96 and 98. Um I can also, for example, instead of increasing in value, I can also decrease in value. I can count backwards. So for example, instead of going up, I could go down in one unit. But guess what's going to happen with this for loop if I do this? If I run this code, then my for loop is going to start printing numbers in decreasing in, uh, in descending order, and it's going to execute forever because the way I have designed my for loop is ill defined. And because the numbers are decreasing, i is never going to be greater than 100. So my program is right now stuck in an infinite for loop, just like I did with uh, my while loop. So we have to be careful with those things and I actually have to force close this program right now. Okay? Um, there's no reason why I should be an integer either. So I could define a float here and say, for example, uh, or I could define a double and uh, double a is going to be equal to 3.25. Uh, it's going to be a is going to be less. Let me just do i. It doesn't matter. i is less than 100 and i every time that every time is going to increase by a value of 1.5. So I'm going to multiply it by itself by 1.5 so that it grows exponentially, all right? So that generates a value that grows very, very fast all the way until it hits 23.20, 83.29, something, something. So as you can see, there's a lot of flexibility about what I can do uh, with a for loop. Again, so long as I keep this pattern of initializing something, checking the value of that something for the continuity of the for loop, and then making sure that I update that something so that at some point it hits that limit and I don't get trapped on an infinite loop, then I will be fine. All right. Um, something I wanted to explain, and this goes back to my initial for loop, was that very typically you can name, for example, the variable that you declare in a for loop. You can name it whatever you want, depending on what kind of for loop you are creating. Uh, but typically um, you will see like I don't know, 95% of the times, you will see this variable being called i, okay? And um, and this is typically because i stands for index, index number, because for loops not only are super, super useful for creating repetition, but they're also incredibly useful for creating, for manipulating, and for accessing arrays. And as we will see in future videos, arrays the way you access the data inside of a list of elements is by the number of the position of that element within the list. So having a structure that gives you, that iterates over numbers zero to whatever the length of the list is at one intervals is very useful to be able to point to those items on the list, all right? And also something that I have not mentioned yet very clearly is the fact that um, we're doing this to print the number to the console. But very honestly, I wouldn't even need to use the variable i in my for loop. It's not strictly necessary. So I can use the variable i just as a way of maintaining and making sure that this thing executes, for example, five times, you know? And then, but I can, I don't really need to use that variable within my for loop. If I just want to print my name five times, then I just, I can just create a loop with a value that goes from zero to five at intervals of one. And then I know that that's going to be like a super simple way of repeating the same action five times. It's only if I want variability, if I want things to change while I'm executing this for loop that I may want to use that value or a combination of, of that value within my for loop, okay? 
Um, so I think this is as much as I want to get within simple for loops at this point. For loops are one of the most powerful basic structures in computer programming. They take a little bit of time to get used to. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about, I'm going to record some more videos about other topics related to repetition. But then at the end of this section, I will probably record a, another video where I'm going to do some exercises to practice uh, significantly creating sequence of numbers or creating even ASCII art using, using for loops. And I really recommend that you follow those exercises because they will make you stronger uh, and they will help you to practice and has, have a wider, um, more ample um, view of how for loops can be used for a lot of stuff. They're one of the most powerful uh, structures. So follow me on the next video and, um, and let's get our hands dirty very soon.